Hello and welcome to the Third Sector Podcast. I'm Lucinda Rouse. And I'm Andy Ricketts. Each week we bring you half an hour of discussion and debate about the important goings on in the charity world. And this week is something of a bumper episode. Emily Burt and I will be joined by two guests to talk about how to make the most of a moment of flux or transition in your organisation as you plan your strategic journey. And later I'll be taking you to some of the charity gardens at the RHS Chelsea Flower Show to find out how they made the most of the very unique platform it provides. But first, you might be able to tell that we're not in our usual studio. We're in our respective homes on opposite sides of town, but we've scrambled at short notice to talk briefly about Rishi Sunak's surprise, but also not surprise, announcement of a general election on the 4th of July and what it means for charities. And Andy, I'm very grateful to have you with us because this isn't the first general election to have been announced in your time working at Third Sector, has it? No, um, I hesitate to say how many I think it's been because it's been a few in my long tenure on Third Sector, but it's always an exciting moment when we have a general election looming. So I'm excited about what the next few weeks will hold. Yeah, so first things first, what has changed overnight for charities? Well, I think the big thing that's changed is really the certainty about an election actually happening. I mean, we knew that one was going to happen, obviously, but we didn't know when it was going to be taking place. Rishi Sunak surprised a lot of individuals by announcing that it was going to take place on the 4th of July. In fact, I think he caught out quite a few people in his own party. So I think the one good thing that it means for charities is that we now know exactly when this is going to happen. So we know there's going to be some kind of time frame for when the next government will start and a bit more certainty about what individual parties are going to be doing. Obviously, we'll be having the manifesto launches shortly and we'll talk about that in a moment. The other thing that's obviously changing is that we're expecting probably a little bit more focus on what charities do in terms of any activity they do around election issues Some of them, particularly around the Rwanda bill, for example, are going to be hotly contested subjects. So I think charities are going to have to watch very carefully that they're making sure they pay attention to the rules around political campaigning and working with individual candidates, because I think they could find that they have a fair degree of mud slung in their direction if they're not adhering to the rules. And even if they are, individual opponents of particular parties might find that they want to make some political gains by um, causing some mischief. Yeah, absolutely. And there are certain bits of legislation that are governing what charities do, particularly in this period around an election, not least the Lobbying Act. We're not going to go into that now, but it is something that we considered in our podcast documentary, The End of Charity, episode four, looking into issues around charity campaigning, particularly in the run up to an election um, and the things that charities need to look out for. So Andy, we had this announcement just this week Um, What do you think the next six weeks and then the little bit beyond that are likely to hold for the charity sector? Well, I mean, we mentioned that everybody was caught by surprise. I I wonder if the Charity Commission and Orlando Fraser weren't exactly caught by surprise because just earlier this week on Monday, um, Orlando Fraser published a blog from the Charity Commission saying what should uh, charities do during (laughs) during the run up to a general election, which I thought was kind of interesting timing. Um, I wonder if he had some kind of inside knowledge. In the short term, I mean, obviously, Parliament has to be dissolved, which won't happen until the end of next week as we publish this. And then we'll be expecting to get the manifestos from the individual parties, probably towards the middle of June, I would guess. And then we'll start to see what exactly each of the main beasts will be saying around issues that uh, affect charities. I think that obviously we know some of the issues that are going to be big. Uh, asylum and um, the the boats and the Rwanda bill are going to be huge political hot potatoes, if you like. But I think other things will probably crop up over the course of the next few weeks. And we don't really know what those are going to be exactly. And in a way, individual charities will have to respond to those when they happen. Have there been any initial 
responses or statements from sector leaders that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, we've seen already some of them talking about the importance of partnership. I mean, I think that's going to be a big issue for sector leaders over the next few weeks. I mean, the way things stand at the moment and the things that the polls would indicate would suggest that we will be seeing a change of government. And I think sector leaders are very much talking about partnership with the next government, however that might look. We obviously saw a few weeks ago, but shortly after the turn of the year, the Labour Party made a big kind of pitch for the sector's attention, if you like, where Sir Keir Starmer stood up and at a uh, pro bono economics meeting and brought a lot of the shadow cabinet with him and talked about how he wants to work with the sector and ask the sector if it would work with a future Labour government, which I think was music to the ears of many sector leaders who feel like they've been sidelined and maybe ignored or even kind of um, stigmatised by the current uh, administration. So it'll be really interesting to see how that pans out, particularly in the early days, should Labour win? Because obviously, then they're not always going to agree with what the government is doing. They're going to want to say some difficult things some of the time. So the, the proof of that dedication to partnership will be seen as we move uh, further down the line. So we watch this space and at Third Sector, we will, of course, be providing coverage on the election and the possible and probable implications for the charity sector. We have already produced a number of long reads in recent months in anticipation of an election this year. Emily Hall has written several pieces about how charities can cut through the political noise and connect with politicians ahead of a general election. And Andy, you wrote about how sector leaders responded to Keir Starmer's pitch to civil society back in January. We'll include links to all of these in the show notes to this episode and of course there'll be more to come. Thanks Andy for hopping onto the mic at such short notice. Your work here is done and our editor Emily Burt is going to join me for the next part of the episode. We recorded it before the election announcement but it is by no means unrelated. Do you know what an inflection moment is? I certainly didn't before I had a chat with Sharath Jeevan, who is an expert on such moments and has just written a book on them. Sharath works with businesses, governments and not-for-profits to support leaders with their organisation's strategic direction. His background has been varied, but often involving the voluntary sector. He was the founding head of eBay for Charity and the chief executive of Global Giving UK before he founded the international educational NGO Stir Education. Hi, Sharith. Hi, Lucinda. Great to be on the show. So first things first, please tell us what we're talking about here. What is an inflection moment? So the way I define it, Lucinda, is to think about that next mountain to climb question Often an organisation, a charity gets to a point, it's been successful, it's doing well, but there's a question of what comes next. And often it can be about redefining that that next mountain very clearly with the help of its stakeholders in a way that is very fresh, very distinctive, very authentic, but is also very much driven by the motivations of the people leading the organisation as well. Okay, so in practical terms, could you give us an example of a point when an organisation or a leader of an organisation might reach such a moment? So I've been working with the B Corp movement. Um, They're the group that certifies companies for social impact. We've got huge companies like Nespresso who are certified members, for example, in their leadership team. They've been around for about eight years in the UK and about 3% of GDP in the UK now goes through the movement. It's incredible in that short space of time to reach that milestone. The tempting thing would be to say, let's try and get to 4% or 5% or 6%. Of course, that will happen. But the leaders of the organization have been really visionary about saying, we want to go deeper. We want to look at some of the more systemic issues around around business and, and the way that business runs. And how do we start to influence people like government, policymakers, business themselves, of course, on that next journey. So a lot of it is that it's a bit like playing a sport where you're maybe you're, I'm a big tennis fan, you're 5-2 up and you can end up sometimes playing not to lose. I think the key thing is to say, actually, once we've got to that first mountain, let's really be ambitious and be creative about defining the next one to go, because that'll really help galvanize us as a team. It'll give us purpose and motivation as leaders of the organization. It will help us raise money towards that, but it will also make a huge impact on the communities we serve. So it's very much a big picture, broad organizational strategy 
point. So why do you think it is that having an awareness for moments like this can help when organisations are trying to really think about their long term strategic directions? Yeah, so often when I when I get asked in to help an organization, Emily, I'm, I'll get sent the strategy, quote unquote. And usually what I find is a series of Excel sheets and if I'm lucky, some PowerPoint slides that basically extrapolate the current for many years out. And it's almost sort of what's become, I think, the problem with strategy, and I talk about that in the, in the book, is that it can become a sort of paint by numbers exercise. I say this as a former strategy consultant myself. I think a lot of this is, right, first of all, looking outside and saying, what is our perspective on the social problem we're trying to, to focus on? How do we see it differently from others? And that, I think, gives us our legitimacy as leaders. We can really see something that others can't see. The B Corp example is a good one because they could see something in the landscape that others may not have been able to see in that example. At the same time, it's also looking inward and saying, what drives us? How can we go? Most great charities I know, whatever size, they, they have a number of options in front of them. They can go in four or five different ways. There's no right answer at these inflection moments. So what's really important is to tap into what drives the team and where they feel that sense of purpose coming from as well. So it's actually quite a reflective purpose. And actually, you know, saying that, I think finding the space and the headspace in a way to go back and say, well, actually, let's just go right back to the roots. What are we here for? How are we trying to solve this often massive, very complicated issue? I wouldn't necessarily, that's that's something that people necessarily make that much time for. And strategy, I think, runs a risk sometimes of, as you say, being a bit prescriptive, a bit paint by numbers Mm. because of that. No, I think what what makes inflection months so hard to navigate, Emily, is the fact that there are different time horizons. And look, the short term, the second hand, if you like, is important. We've all got to be reactive and it's not an easy environment to operate in. I know you've had a number of episodes on, on some of the current realities in the sector. But the key thing is to think about the long term first, the hour hand first. And I use a framework called Dial when helping organizations that have used it in the book. Um, let's start the long term to begin with. Think about what that long-term direction is, and that does require some quite deep reflection, stepping back and so on. Once we get that hour hand set, we can look at how does the minute hand, which I think about very much as a team potential, how can it align with the hour hand? And then how can the second hand, which is more the day-to-day motivation and culture, how can that support everything together? So it's really when the hour hand, minute hand, and, and second hands are aligned and moving in the, in the right way. I think we have real magic as a charity. It does sound like an ideal situation and and very zen, it feels, (laughs) talking about it in this way. But obviously, when you're at the coalface, you've got all of these competing priorities. You don't have enough hours in the day. How can leaders make sure that they carve out the time to consider these, well, this inflection moment and the things that go into planning around it? History is is littered with examples of, of, let's say, companies who have been doing well, have been successful, but really squandered away that opportunity. Look at um, Blockbuster. You know, there was a Blockbuster about 20 years ago. There was a Blockbuster next to us. I paid probably more in in fines than I did for the actual rentals themselves. <laughs> and it, even 20 years, you could tell that the price of broadband was going to was gonna plummet over time. Blockbuster had a chance to to be Netflix You know, before Netflix was there. I think it had the t- chance to buy Netflix twice and chose not to because it was so captured by its own current model. It was very profitable. And so I think what I would just be really, really careful about is any kind of complacency bias where because the world is steady as it is, it may not be steady even six months from now. And I think the the volatile environment we've had from cost of living to, you know, some of the geopolitical changes and so on around us, I think it's more important that we're more responsive and, and bolder and faster in these times as well. And I think, yeah, organisations of all size will know a lot about that sense of volatility right now. And I think there's probably a particular challenge there, which is, you know, how you really make space for that long term vision and thinking big and thinking, well, how do we move to the next mountain, as you say, while at the same time having this voice in the back of your head going, I don't even know if I'm going to have funding in a year's time. And I think that can probably be a barrier for organisations making big plans because they don't know how they will actually practically make it work. But you still feel like there's value in going big. I think the biggest trap I see um, nonprofit organizations fall into again and again, Emily, is that they try to chase what they think is fundable. And what happens is that everyone then converges, everyone ends up doing something very similar, it becomes very homogenous, and then no surprise, funders don't want to fund them. And it's just a, it creates a almost a death spiral. So actually, I think when you're at that point of inflection, that inflection moment, 
it's much better to step back and say, what really makes us fresh and distinctive? How do we see the world differently from others? It does mean going quite, in some ways, quite different directions from what others in your space might be doing. But I think we need a lot more authenticity, a lot more distinctiveness in our sector, and a lot more, you know, we've got um, very precious resources, they're quite constrained. There's no point us overlapping with others. So if we have something unique, let's really play to that. And you work with people in all different sectors, from the corporates to universities, I understand. But thinking specifically within the voluntary sector, is there a difference, do you think, in how charities of different sizes and leaders of charities of different sizes can manage this process of strategic thinking and their strategic journey? Yeah, what it's so similar is I think there are some very, very common themes. So I work with large um, charities like Ashoka, for example, Groups like Teach for All, the mother organization of Teach First, for example, as well, they're in tens of millions of dollars a year, all the way through those in hundreds of thousands of dollars or pounds a year in terms of annual turnover and income. I think the dynamics are more complex when you get to the very large organizations. There are more stakeholders to think about. I think there can actually be more of an incumbent momentum in, as the larger you get because you've got so many stakeholders to manage all the time. The second hand just goes much faster. So I think in both cases, it's about really stepping away, as you were saying, Emily, and thinking about what are you really trying to achieve, what makes you distinctive, and thinking about that that piece. And I, I find there are three types of expectations that we've got to let go as leaders. One is around money, so first you find funding. There's often a fear about if I go off in a different direction, I'm really worried I'm going to lose all my funding alongside it. And I've actually helped negotiate a number of conversations between voluntary organizations and their funders often. And Funders are often actually honestly jumping up in joy the fact that they their grantee wants to become more authentic and go in a different direction. But it just does require some really conscious and intentional communication. So that can be bridged as well. There's obviously the people worry about in our team that they join for a certain mission. You know, will this compromise that? And again, if if it's a journey where if they can be heard and their voices can help to refine that. So I do a lot of that of that with organizations. Finally, it's a leader themselves, actually, the leadership teams, the CEO of the organization. Often they have a very strong sense of where they want to go, but they may never have believed it was fully possible. And part of this is actually say, look, this is your organization now with your stakeholders. You can do pretty much whatever you want within, obviously, some ethical boundaries and so on. But actually, that's quite liberating. And that chance to really set free and go the way they want to do go can really galvanize support and momentum at the same time. Hmm. Well, now seems like a very opportune moment to bring our second guest into the discussion. So we're delighted to be joined as well by Hannah Stevens, who's the chief executive of Elect Her, a community interest company that works to support women to stand for political office in Britain. Hi, Hannah. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for joining us. So you've been working with Sharath for the past few months, and you've just come out of a very interesting couple of years at Elect Her. Could you tell us about the series of events that inform your inflection moment? Yeah, absolutely. I guess it's important to state in some sense, this is the beginning of a new strategic phase for us. I took over the leadership of the organisation in 2020. We had a four-year plan. And so this was the time, the start of 2024 was the time for the next four-year iteration. So there was a natural opportunity to really carve out what we wanted for the next four years but at the same time as that some really key things have naturally presented themselves in our world that really really do define our inflection moment I think there's several points there one of which is that the world turned to zoom in 2020 four years ago and we were ready and waiting. We'd already set up a lot of our work on Zoom. We just didn't have a huge audience. And a lot of women were really galvanized what was happening during the pandemic and turned to us. So we saw a real growth in the number of participants and women interested in engaging in our work four years ago. And now, four years on, a lot of those women are now getting elected. It's a three, four-year cycle. Some people, it happens incredibly quickly, and those stories are so fun. But generally, to get yourself embedded in a political party, to navigate, to understand how it works, to prepare yourself as a candidate, and then to get selected and elected is about a three- or four-year journey. So last May, we saw a fantastic group of women 
from our community elected. And we've just seen the same again last week. So there is this moment where we've seen the full cycle of women's participation for our work, which really enables this reflective time. Which bits of that worked? What do we want to do more of? Which bits do we want to turn away from? So I think that's one key reason why this is a moment for us. We've got the opportunity to build on that learning. Then alongside that, 2024 is a massive election year globally, like more voters than ever in the history will be going to the polls this year, about 49% of the world's population. So actually democracy is in people's minds at the moment. And in the UK, we've got loads of elections, 2,600 councillors were elected last week, directly elected mayors, police and crime commissioners, London Assembly, and this inevitable general election when it's ever it's going to come. So people are interested in this subject, which interestingly the rest of the time sadly in an electoral cycle it's less interesting to the wider population and I also think the third point there is really that everyone can see that politics isn't working and and you know really what we need to be doing to improve our democracy and I think there's this opportunity for elector to really be present and be part of the conversation to establish what needs to happen so I think all these different bits are coming together in a fantastic moment that really really does define our inflection moment and I've just been really lucky to to meet Sharath and start to work with him at this exact moment in our evolution as an organization it's been an incredibly beneficial process and you talked there about the importance of thinking as you say about what's worked for you until now what hasn't worked for you and and thinking about that kind of longer term picture of course this is going to be a huge year but beyond that what do you see as being the sort of key benefits of taking that time to have those considerations of what's worked and what hasn't and how is this going to inform your longer term strategic direction I think what we're lucky to have as an organization is this kind of ongoing feedback loop. And I don't think I totally appreciated that that was how we designed our work. But I realized there's new language that I would commit to now that we are now the experts in the lived experience of women engaging in democracy and politics. And so with that realization that we hold all of this knowledge because we are always listening to women about their experiences, whatever it is, as an elected member, as someone that's just trying to engage in a political party, as someone that's trying to decide who to vote for, we are talking to women all the time. And similarly, with our partners and our collaborators and our donors, we love to engage in those conversations. What is working? What isn't working? What should we be doing more of? So I guess what I've realized, and again, working with Sharath has really helped me bring this to the surface, is that we have been doing that consultation with stakeholders continuously. So we really, really know what we should be doing. And I think I have quite a strategic mind and have been asking myself these questions continuously. But actually to define a moment where I need to commit to all of that learning and to really articulate what does that mean for the four, five, 10 year journey of our organization has been a really fantastic experience, which I needed to do. My board are asking me for a clear written articulated strategic plan for the next four years, but having the space to work on that and to ground all of the understanding that I have gathered as the leader, but my colleagues and my team have gathered in listening to women really ground that and define our next phase of evolution is is a really exciting and vital thing. And I feel really, really strongly that the plan that we're putting in place is absolutely the right one for our work. So it sounds like your work with Sharith hasn't necessarily brought in anything particularly new. You're not reinventing the wheel in terms of what you're doing and, and your awareness for what you're doing. It's more kind of making sense of it and making sure that your plan is really, really clear. Yeah, I found it really affirmative because the questions that Sharith is asking me, I have been asking myself, but having a person and a safe space to articulate that and and challenge it and interrogate some of my thinking has been really fantastic. And I often think, you know, we talk to women on their journey into leadership about telling your story and becoming comfortable with the story that you're presenting about yourself. And I think there's also an element here, which is just repeatedly talking out loud, right? In this safe space, we're working together about what we want to do. And we come back together a week later and we're kind of talking on the same thing, but from a different angle, really is helping to refine the story of what we're trying to do. And then therefore kind of embed actually what that means in terms of budgets, work plans, staffing, uh, governance. 
so I, yeah, I found it incredibly affirmative that I was absolutely on the right page and the right direction in terms of my thinking, but really grounding to have that space to collaborate with him. I feel that Shout has really coached me through the process of developing that strategic plan in an incredibly healthy way. And again, I wouldn't have used the language of inflection moment. I wouldn't have really understood what a key moment this was in our evolution. I just would have I think I would have was framing it as the end of one strategic phase and the start of another one. Whereas again, reading the book, working with him has helped me to see actually this is a really key moment. And I'm so busy that this moment could have passed me by and actually pushing myself to create the space to define it, articulate it, work out what it wants to be has been an absolute gift. And I'm super excited for what it means for our for our work over the next few years. You are at the head of a small organisation. It sounds like you're spinning a lot of plates. Practically speaking, how are you able to carve out the time for this work? Well, working with Shout means I've been forced to. I'm not going to waste his time if he's if he's committing to supporting us in this way. We've made an agreement. We've got an understanding. This has become a project, I guess, for me in a way that other things might be. There's a sense of accountability in working together that we've designed this series of workshops, these conversations, weekly, bi-weekly, and Sharath gives me small bits of homework that I have to do. And again, had I been left to my own devices, I would have procrastinated. And then next week, I would have quickly written a pretty cool paper about everything I've learned over the past four years. And I would have submitted it and it would have been good and it would have carried us forward. And it would have had, you know, let's say 45%, let's say I'm plucking that out a little bit. It would have had 45% of the content, but actually going through this really reflective process, retelling the story, interrogating which bits of this make us unique and how we want to really push ourselves yeah, I've been coached through the process and I've been held to account and that's led to a much richer uh, experience and much richer document to submit in the end. And ultimately, I wouldn't have prioritized the time in my own calendar to do that weekly base touch, that weekly bit of drafting, that weekly bit of reflection. I I wouldn't have prioritized that had I not had another human being and a lovely man that Sharath is holding me to account on that in a, in a supportive and and comfortable way. So I think there is something really interesting about leaders, particularly leaders of small organization who are doing all the stuff to really, how do you create the space to embed yourself in the strategic moment and, and, and really repeatedly revisit what you're trying to do. So you're really there for that accountability piece. Are you, Sheriff? I I would love to hear about your perspective. I mean, what have you seen that you've found really interesting and valuable about Electa's process and and how Hannah has been working? I think Hannah's an amazing leader. So that was very clear when I first was introduced through a a, a funder, actually. And also, I think back to what she said about those sort of internal, external um, triggers around her, given the political cycle and what's going on. I often think about it in terms of sort of starships and asteroids, there was a starship, the internal change around Hannah taking the, the reins of the organization over during the pandemic and so on, and all the external change going on, the election cycle happening at the same time. And I think in terms of that direction, there's a really exciting chance for Electa to really make a, a very mainstream difference on how parties are actually structured and their culture through the prism of the amazing leaders they uh, are able to nurture and support and develop all the way through their careers. So it just felt I'm always... Um, um, I love working with leaders who have an incredibly outsized impact. It's a small organization financially. Hopefully, it'll be it'll be um, bigger in the in the years to come. I'm sure, but incredible impact for 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 that as well. And so, that ability to really harness that direction, go for it. Um, yeah. So it's been a, a lot of fun working together. Some definitely some tensions at times. I think I know we probably say that things with, you know, all in a, in a healthy, respectful way. Just said, do we really um, agree with this? And often, my role can be to be that critical friend and say, this doesn't quite. This feels a bit too convenient. Are we, are we really get to the core of this, is this really what you want to do? Um, but is that sort of constant tussle as a process? And it, it can be uncomfortable at times as well. That's part of the the fun of it as well sometimes. Well, going outside of kind of the the everyday, like the, ultimately that should be uncomfortable, shouldn't it? It should. And I think I think what happens actually is strange, I think, for leaders in the sector. And I, I you know, in fact, having been a CEO myself for 15 years in the sector is that we're sort of almost trained to have smaller and smaller ambitions over time, not bigger and bigger ones. It's just interesting how the dynamics of funding and constant um, stress about, you know, keeping our organizations alive and actually healthy, it means we tend to rein ourselves in. And I think the good news is actually if we can actually open ourselves out a bit and think about what's possible. I didn't quite do it with Hannah, but often a question I ask partners think about, imagine you had an Aunt Meg who sadly passed away and she'd give you 100 million in her legacy. 
what would you do if that happened, if you never had to fundraise again? And that's obviously, you know, very few of us have that Aunt Meg, unfortunately and unfortunately. But given that that situation, that often frees the mind up to say, what what would the ideal thing look like? And then it's, it's worked backwards from where we are now to see how could we get as close to that as possible. So beyond hiring you and your services. <laughs> of course, yes, of course. Yes, of course. And uh, reading, <clears throat> reading your book, um, which is called Inflection, A Roadmap for Leaders at a Crossroads. What tips do you have for anybody listening to this who feels like they might be at a juncture? How can they make the most of their inflection moment? Yeah, so I think the first thing I'd say, Lucinda, is to recognise the moment for what it is. I think there's a real tendency in the sector to, I felt it myself as a leader, to be constantly busy, to feel like we never have time to really step out and have some air. I think that can be fatal at inflection moments. So think about, is there an asteroid out there? Is there something big in the external environment? It could be a regulation change. It could be how funders are evolving. It could be how the theme of your sector is shifting. Look out for the asteroid. Are there any starship changes? Are there any changes in the team, governance, you as a leader, anything significant going on on that side? If one or both of those things are happening, you're almost certainly at an inflection moment. And think about that point about maybe you've got to that first mountain, what's that second mountain look like? So first, I just recognize that not all time is created equal. Really give yourself license to focus on this and take it seriously. The second thing I think is, if you do feel you're at that moment, think about direction first. Think, go back to the problem that you first wanted to go and sort of help solve. What was it about the problem that really attracted you? How has your understanding of the problem evolved over time? And how could you channel that new understanding to really be distinctive and different in the way that Hannah is doing very much in the world of politics, for example? And then try to write that perspective down. Think about the direction your organization could take building on that perspective. And there's some tools in the book that can help practically with that. The third thing I'd say is then once you know that direction and you know you're in a reflection moment, make sure you align your whole organization against it. So... Think about the every member of the team, how can their full potential really be harnessed against that? Now, I talk in the book about these ideas of authenticity, connection, excellence. These are three things that we can often think about in terms of unleashing potential. How can we make sure that really is as closely aligned as possible to where you want to go as an organization there? So if, for example, um, Hannah's going to be doing a lot more work around system change and so on, the team um, focus and, and culture will need to move more towards that. Just take a practical example. And then finally, just think about what will keep you and the team motivated and learning as you go on the journey. There will be bumps in the road. How do you make it really enjoyable for yourself, make each day feel like you're making incremental progress and, and keep celebrating and, and, and marking success as you go on that, that, that journey of inflection as well? Some really useful pointers there. Sharif and Hannah, it's been great to have you both on. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks. Now we're off to the RHS Chelsea Flower Show to take a look around three of the 15 charity gardens funded by the grant maker Project Giving Back. You might be able to hear from the recordings that the day got progressively more rainy, but it was still dry when I sat in the Terence Higgins Trust Garden with Richard Angel, the charity's chief executive. Richard describes how their garden is an artistic expression of the change in messaging around an HIV diagnosis, from the tombstone advert of the 1980s when the disease was considered to be a death sentence, to the current reality and hope of an end to new cases by 2030. So as you walk into the garden, you see essentially a big slate monolith that has fallen into the water as if it was that tombstone from back in the day and around it has grown plants that grow in an environment that is harsh and difficult and thrived against the odds like many did with HIV. Um, The water goes up and covers the tombstone and goes down to reveal the bridge to the rest of the garden. As you go through the garden you see the red of World AIDS Day and the red ribbon. You see flowers representing people's diversity. You see a boulder being held up by sticks Um, looking at the defiance, the people who survived, the people who uh, provided medicine and science and action and campaign for a better world. And then you end up where we are now in this beautiful, serene, almost like home out in the wilderness because people living with HIV can take one pill a day and can plan their future. They can sit with their partner, they can have sex without passing on the virus and they can look through our window of hope 
into the goal that is 2030. Why did you want to be part of Project Giving Back at Chelsea? So in HIV World, we're always keen to take our message to new audiences. For too many people, they think that because HIV and people dying of the virus isn't in the media every day, that things have moved on and everything is good. And I think it was really important, the demographic here at Chelsea are people who witnessed that initial advert, but maybe haven't seen that HIV has changed. And this is a really great opportunity. You'll know big events post-COVID are really challenging for charities. The cost base has gone up exponentially many of the people in the kind of hospitality sector are still paying back covid debts they're unable to provide charities with even mates rates let alone what we used to get of kind of donated venues in the past so events are always really challenging for charities now but have been a key part of how we fundraised before sometimes it's been that event that's given people the opportunity to make their donation but it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we're bringing in more money and we're spending on those events and that's been really challenging post-Covid. So this has been a lovely opportunity because Project Giving Back have been so generous in enabling us to cover those core costs that people know that any contributions they're making to THT after the garden are all going on doing our core work, not organising a garden. And that has been for them that we are very thankful to give us that platform and that opportunity and recognise that changing landscape post-Covid and how challenging that is for all colleagues in the charity sector. Good morning, I'm Hattie Gowie. I'm the CEO of Project Giving Back. Project Giving Back is a grant making organisation. We're a charity in our own right and we are set up with the sole purpose of funding Gardens for Good Causes at the RHS Chelsea Flower Show. This is your third year, so looking back at the two previous years, what have been like real successes in terms of what the charities themselves have got out of being at Chelsea? Yeah, it's been, it's really interesting because when people apply to us, they apply with different objectives. So it might be fundraising, it might be about media awareness, it might be about getting new celebrity ambassadors. So we like outline that with them of like, what do you want to get out of it? I think for me, first year was such a success from the RNLI perspective. They raised over 800,000 pounds in one night. But then last year, smaller charities like Horatio's Garden won Best in Show and they were sort of catapulted onto a national stage with that and it's been massively impactful for them. The thing that I feel really strongly about what we're doing is we are giving charities an opportunity to do something they'd never be able to do themselves. And I sometimes think that actually philanthropists or corporate sponsors should have a think about why don't you have an open conversation with a charity and say, you know, if you could do anything, if you had Nike's budget to market yourselves, what would you do? And perhaps fund that for them, like gift them that opportunity and see what that charity would do with it. Because I think charities are given such a hard time in the media about how they spend their money and where it goes. And so they're nervous. Like They're not going to risk funding a marketing event or going to a show like this that mm. might be a huge payoff. And actually, if you're a supporter of a charity, maybe you could unlock that for them. We work with a lot of organisations that are, you know, either dealing with social issues, inequality, and actually putting them mainstream in Chelsea. It's a pretty good place to be for a charity. Next, we move on to Bowel Research UK's garden, where I found the charity's Director of Engagement, Marketing and Income, Daniel Magson. So we're currently sitting in the Bowel Research UK microbiome garden in the hive structure we have here. Um, We're surrounded by a sculptural wall, which is themed around the inner wall of a bowel, which is why it belongs in the garden. Um, We're surrounded by edible meadows, so 90% of the plants in this garden will have a positive impact on the microbiome if you eat the right parts and prepare them correctly. (laughs) So we compete in a very busy space at Bowel Research UK. The charity was formed from two previous organisations in 2020. Um, Obviously that was during the pandemic, so therefore our brand awareness really struggled. We didn't get a name for ourselves. So at first, when I saw the opportunity, I thought we should apply for this. If we can get Chelsea Flower Show, it's going to really help our brand awareness. And it'd be a great part of our communication strategy. 
On the flip side of that, uh, as a charity, we used to, in our previous forms, have a lot of major donor support, and over the years, those have lapsed. And looking at the audience of Chelsea Flowers Show, I thought it would be a really good opportunity to engage new prospects and try and re-engage some of our lapsed donors by inviting them to the events here as well. And thinking about how you might approach events going forward, have you learned anything which is going to inform how you plan for and execute your involvement at events? One of the key lessons we learned was really building synergy between our comm side and fundraising. We made sure that the teams were always working together on this. We were part of one team, we had crossover, so our PR support was really feeding into our fundraising strategies in Chelsea, but leading up to that as well. We just had London Marathon that got a lot of press. Um, so we've just made sure that whatever we're doing, fundraising and comms are always speaking together, supporting each other. So it meant that when we got to Chelsea, it could easily be, oh, let's all focus on donations, or let's just focus on the celebrities and the brand awareness we get. But actually, we've managed to focus on both because we're all working together, we understand our objectives, uh, and they're shared objectives. I'm Ulla Maria, the garden designer of the Muscular Dystrophy UK Forest Maven Garden. It's designed for the Muscular Dystrophy UK community and the key idea was to showcase how high quality outdoor spaces outside of the clinical sterile environments can help people when they are going through really difficult times of their lives. And also it's inspired by the Japanese practice of forest bathing, which means being in the forest, absorbing its atmosphere and really sort of taking it in through the senses and in return it gives us many mental and physical health benefits. So I was just sitting down to have a chat with Debbie from Muscular Dystrophy um, about the great success that they have made of this opportunity only to be ushered off the garden to make way for Monty Don, I know my place, um, because there's a very exciting announcement about to be made. So my name is Debbie Hoods and I'm Head of Philanthropy Partnerships and Ambassador Engagement at Muscular Distribute UK. And I have just witnessed a very exciting announcement. You've been in the middle of it. Tell me what just happened. So after 18 months of um, long hard work, Ulla Maria just won Best in Show, which means the Muscular Dystrophy UK Forest Bathing Garden has been awarded the Best in Show Award, which is incredible. Huge congratulations. Um, tell me what your role has been. I've been project managing the garden from the charity side, so it's been a full-time job for about 18 months. We've done lots of research with charities that have been here before to find out what worked for them, what didn't work, and kind of made a project plan from start to finish. It included everything from merchandise, what the volunteers would wear, the brochure that you give out to all of these horticulturalists that come and collect them, fundraising, and also, most importantly, how to keep our community involved so they didn't feel like they weren't part of it. What makes Chelsea, as an opportunity, different to any other event that, that you work with? We support 110,000 people who live with a muscle-wasting or weakening condition. So to be on a stage in front of a whole new audience for us is just something we never dreamed of, to be honest. We're used to talking to people who have heard of muscular dystrophy because they're the people that we support, they're the people that need us. A lot of people here today will never meet anyone with muscular dystrophy, but they now will have heard of it. And that's what's brilliant about being here. Massive congratulations once again. A glass of bubbles has just been put down next to you, so I'm not going to keep you from it any longer. Thank you so much, Thank Debbie. you very much. I hope you enjoyed our walk around the RHS Chelsea Flower Show. And that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be marking Volunteers Week with guests joining us from Scotland and Northern Ireland. But for now, thanks to our guests and our producer, Nav Powell.